please. Okay. Talk about the We Will Love You game. Mm-hmm. Or You Will Love Me. Gonna <laughs> that, that one. It's going to definitely be in the way. Folks, we are live. Welcome back this evening for another Bird Dog Chat with Ethan Cat. We have a, a brand new puppy. Thanks, Dustin. Look at that. He's like, this is crazy. I want to eat mm-hmm. something. I'll chew up your microphone. I'll bite your face. You know, puppy stuff. Mm. Puppy kisses. You can all, uh, you can all do the. Uh, oh, puppy breath. Yeah, say say you be jealous, folks. Be jealous. I have a puppy, and maybe some of you do, but you don't have this puppy. <laughs> so there is that. Looks like we've got some check-ins coming in already. We're gonna settle this guy down. This is a game he and I like to play most most evenings. Um, I hold him somewhere in the vicinity of this, supporting his lower half and then pinning his upper half. And he does this kind of like, uh, can I get away? Can I cuddle? Can I do anything? The answer is no. I have just enough here. Now, I've explained this to quite a few different people, and they say, oh, my puppy bites me or whatever. Like, literally, how is he going to bite me while we're doing this? You just pin him there. You got to pin just a little bit harder. That's the ticket, okay? So This game we lovingly referred to as You Will Love Me. You will love me. And the the best part about it is, I don't know, he probably, one and a half out of every ten times he falls asleep. So. so it exponentially gets better. So the first time we play these games, he fights and he struggles for long amounts of time. And then he realizes, hey, this isn't getting me anywhere. And then he just gives in and he does fall asleep. I actually have an adorable picture of him all relaxed with Ethan on the couch. I want to do I feel I want to do just a little camera adjustment. Can we just roll slide this down just the tripod down? Cuz I'm looking at the screen reading stuff and it, I feel like I'm We're looking way down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh Hold this on folks, we're in the cosmos. <laughs> <laughs> Getting closer, getting closer, and then that bottom leg should slide. So we were early, folks, but we weren't prepared. So we're fairly there's that. technically correct-ish. Yeah, oh. we're close. Okay, I'm I gonna, like it. I'm gonna Much try better. and Thank do you. this like show my phone. Ooh, just there you go, <laughs> and you nailed it. And we're there. Ha ha! Look at that. All right, you gotta cover cover your face. There it is. Isn't that cute? <laughs> So Love cute. it. So that's something that we do in the evenings, and it's really good for the puppies to learn to give in to that. And it, like I said, the first few nights, exponentially more struggling, more fighting. Then he learns, hey, that doesn't get him anywhere. He doesn't get out of that. And then he gives in to that and then sits there calmly. Now, this is a little bit different situation. There's a lot of distractions, like right in his face, cords and cameras and microphones and things like that. Yeah, But absolutely. he is really doing a pretty good job. And it's important for them to learn this. Um, this is a good part of like nail maintenance stuff too because he's got to sit there still when we do nails. But anyway, we always do check-ins, which we kind of have skipped over because we were talking about this adorable little squirmy puppy that's in your lap. Then we'll come back to the details on this guy. Yeah. So first check-in of the night from Garrett in Missouri. Countdown party. Countdown to party time. <laughs> Wednesday night party time, Kat and Ethan, bird dog chat. Um, checking in from Minnesota. Colorado. Oh, I skipped you. Sorry. Minnesota, Colorado, northern Indiana, New Hampshire, north Mississippi, New Jersey, Oregon, Pennsylvania. Hey, Miss Kelly. Does it jump? Jumped. It jumped. We, I turd. was just. Ke- there we go. Kelly dirty from chat room. New Jersey. Uh, Maine, New Jersey, nearest town, probably Belvedere. Ooh, Ooh, I like that kind of vodka. vodka. (laughs) (laughs) Wisconsin here, Alberta, Canada. Hey, Kaylin. Tina, how are you doing? We've got Justin Webster. Zeke's doing great. He's uh, got his puppy in from Atlanta in for training. River Edge in northern Jersey. Um. California, table is cramping my stuff. Northern Florida, New Hampshire, Cottonwood, California. We got South Carolina, Omaha. Hey, that's not too far from here. I haven't seen a single Kansas check-in yet. 
that's sad. They're uh, coming. Come on now. <laughs> Jumped again. Uh, Florida, Pennsylvania, Red Lodge, Montana. Ooh, Red Lodge, Gr- Montana. Griff Mon- lovers. Whoop, Montana. Whoop. Um, do they Montucky? Is that a thing? I've heard people say that Montucky. You gotta let me know. Montana, Montucky. I've heard that. And da, 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 Southern Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota. Hey, Melanie. Uh, Massachusetts. Duncan and Sully. Y'all need to come visit. North Dakota. That's my homegrown state. Alabama, so another North Dakota. How do you oh say? No. no, that's the same North the Dakota. The thing in which you take groceries from a grocery store. A bag. Is it a bag? Yeah, it's a bag. It's a ba- bag or is it a bag? Bag. Well, how do I say it? How is it spelled? B A G. Pronounced bag. Bag. That's what I said. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now that we've <laughs> gone over that logistics Georgia, Michigan, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Austin, Texas, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, Southern Illinois, Glen Falls, New York, Northern Nevada, Quebec, Canada. Which puppy call name is El Tesoro? Ooh, Ooh, we'll get into that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good question. Fargo, North Dakota. Whoop, whoop. Hey, I went to college in Grand Forks. Western. Hey, Sue, Sue. Yeah, I think, <laughs> we're, I think they're called something else now. Yeah, but they're the Fighting Hawks. How lame is that? Is that what they are? Okay. I Appleton, think so. Wisconsin, Idaho, Iowa. Cool. Thank you guys for checking in. Again, no Kansas. Sad. Lame. Kansas didn't represent. Okay, here. There it is. There it is. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> I was going to be like, I got to type Kansas. We're checking in from Kansas. Um, Another Fargo. There you go. No, that's the same guy. That's the same guy. Oh. We have hey, Dental Lab. Sue, Sue. Nope, but honey. I know. Fargo is not the Sue. I understand this. That's why I'm chanting it back at him. Oh, got it, got it. Just picking. Um, so how this, uh, breakdown is, just remember everybody needs to get their bingo cards. Bingo is a... Fun game played by patrons. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, Patreon is our online dog training community. And we have a new addition to that, but they're two different things. And we kind of want to break down what those are and how they work. First of all, if you are a patron, you're set up on different tiers. And those tiers are specifically designed in different levels of help from Kat and I. You get help on the daily, whether that be from something as simple as just being able to message and not feel bad about sending text messages all the time or whatever it may be. You're paying a very reasonable amount in our eyes is for a service that you get to ask questions on the daily, as well as send videos of your training for us to review and get back to you on what you're doing right and wrong. We have tiers all the way up to weekly or bi-weekly video chats where I can actually be part of your training session and help you to not make mistakes or move past some of those tough parts. Now, Kat, you have recently finished up something that's very, very cool. Yeah, so you guys have been asking for a very long time for a step-by-step, drawn-out path of training. So that's what we finally put together. We have tons of videos on our YouTube channel. If you guys are here, you know we have a YouTube channel. And uh, we decided to put it in a more organized format with a little more structure to it. Um, There's lessons and lesson plans and weekly routines that you can follow along with. And that is a more step-by-step follow along. You can still set up some um, live consults at the end of each of those lessons if you'd like to with us. Uh, But it is pretty laid out and has a lot of information about how you should be going through the basic training process. Then if you need that little bit of extra help, you can jump on those consults that are offered at a discounted price um, with the course. That's at standingstonesupply.com under our courses tab. And it's the step-by-step dog training program. Um, It is geared more towards versatile breeds at this moment, but a lot of the beginning stuff is very similar to um, any dog from the obedience side of things. Um, And it is anything that you want to do with your dog. You can start at eight weeks through a year, or if you've got a little bit older dog, you can still start at the beginning of that. Um, But Patreon is a little different in the sense that you can actually customize that a little bit more and get customized one-on-one help, as well as if you're struggling with specific behavioral or training issues that you just have this hurdle that you can't overcome um, from 
puppy biting or <laughs> knock um, your head on the <laughs> microphone. So uh, basically, if you break it down, if you are a doer and a self starter and you want to do it all on your own, step by step training program has everything there that you need. He is tickled. We've got a little boy up here spending a little bit of time while we're doing this, watching a cartoon on, on YouTube. YouTube. And he's found something that has made him feel. He is laughing out loud over there, and it is making me laugh out loud over here. It's so cute. And the other side of it is, it says, miss the first half of that. Where is this plan available? Standingstonesupply.com. Throw it in there. Uh, there's a tab at the top that says courses, and uh, there are a few coming soon, as well as um, including, but not limited to, how to whelp and raise a litter of puppies, formal retrieving work. We're actually in the process of finalizing the eight weeks to 12 months with a Labrador retriever. Be a combination of really cool stuff, more geared toward a dog that is not a short hair. So that will be, there it is. There's the link, folks. We will be doing um, that for the people that want to work on their schedule. If you need the extra help, Patreon's a great place to sign up and get help. We would love the opportunity. Excited for the step-by-step -step training. We'd love the opportunity to help you in any way we can and want to say thank you to all patrons as the largest supporter of everything that we do here. So if you watch a YouTube video or you utilize any of the resources that we provide, those are brought to you by patrons. Thank you for that. All right, so this evening we are um, talking primarily talking puppies. about this guy. Yeah. Now, the last thing I was going to say, the um, bird dog chat bingo. We're going to give away something. I don't know. I hadn't thought that far ahead, but we will give away something, the first person with a bingo. And um, you get those uh, by being a patron. So what? Uh, I was going to say our brand new treat pouches would be perfect. Yeah. Do we have one up here? No. No. I don't. We don't. You, well, did you use it in training today? Yeah. Down downstairs, yeah. So we don't have it here, but we can throw a link so you guys can see it somewhere. But we got these brand new treat pouches in, and we can do that as part of our giveaway. Somebody says Somebody's bingo. got bingo already? Ah, come um, on. Um, Really? Y are you pulling my leg? We got we to gotta verify this bingo. But we are going to be talking about puppies, puppies, and more puppies, including this guy, uh, which kind of gears into, someone had a question about the El Tesoro. You do not have a bingo yet. Nice try, Jacob. So you get your bingo card on uh, Patreon by being a patron. All you have to do is listen to the silly things that we do. Miss Kelly helps to organize that a little bit, come up with some brand new stuff for this evening. Um, so check that out. Now, this guy, sorry. No, one more thing. Okay. There's one more okay, thing. Okay, one more thing. Go for it. Play bingo. Win something. It'll be fun. Then also um, questions. We will answer them here shortly. Start throwing them in there. The uh, questions will be prioritized by Super Chats, but then also any questions that come up, we want to answer them for you guys after we get through this. So. so now we can talk about puppies, puppies, and more puppies. All the puppies. So... We want to talk a little bit about this new little guy and then also talk about puppies in the house with children, puppies in training, and puppies taking them for their first hunting season. So no, he is a he is a bitey little thing. Like we haven't had a bitey little puppy this bitey in a while. So that's kind of fun. We'll be working through some of that. Maybe there'll be a video coming out. Um, so bitey. Yeah. But it's really cool. So Kids and puppies, they feed off of each other, right? The energy just escalates and can become a little bit of chaos. And it can encourage inappropriate play by the puppy as well as inappropriate play by the children. And so that's definitely something that we are working on with Aiden. And, I mean, Cade a little bit, but he's pretty young. He's not even 18 months yet. So he just tries to basically avoid the puppy, and if the puppy jumps on him, he kind of gets up, might cry a minute, and then he gets up. So Aiden is working on doing a really good job 
basically correcting the behavior of Hex jumping up on him. It's really cool to see that understanding and how the puppy actually respects Aiden when he has to handle him. Aiden does a really good job, but it has not come easily. It's taken a lot of coaching, a lot of helping, a lot of tears, a lot of getting knocked down, and a lot of puppies for him to work with. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've had lots of practice for him. Um, Going to knock my microphone over here? No, just trying to take a little tension off of that bad boy. That's what this drink is for. Aye. So... Um, I wanted to mention, first and foremost, that there was a question in relation to this, but it's kind of cool. This puppy right here, is na his name is Hex. We haven't really 100% officially 1,000... We've hinted at him, but we haven't officially announced him. And now, yeah. now I kind of am like, Meh, I don't know if we can announce him, because we announced his sister, Vale, Standing Stone's El Tesoro Stop. Illusion, and she blew up the internet on Instagram, at least in regards to, like, our Instagram, um, to get, like, 11,000 likes, which is a lot huge for, mm -hmm. for our Instagram type stuff. If you don't know, we also have Instagram. Um, and the picture that <coughs> I took did amazing, and now it's like, well, I don't really know <laughs> if we should post him and kind of, like, disappointment. Wah, 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 wah. wah. No, <laughs> this is Hexer, okay? H-E-X. You add the E-X, uh, the E-R on the end just for the fun of it. But some of the cool stuff about him specifically is he meets a couple a couple different categories. First of all, he's a liver male. The last liver male that we have kept, and he hasn't 100% made the cut as far as breeding dog yet, but we hope. He's got showing some good things thus far. The last liver male we kept was Shooter. He turned to 10 on October 18th. And then we've got Clay upcoming. But he isn't hasn't made done. The cut yet. Yep, he yep. hasn't done all the things yet. He's young. He's just about to turn a year old. So, or he just turned a year old. I got to look at his birthday. But he is definitely just on the verge of still evaluating. This is his first hunting season, so we're learning a lot about him still. Um, but this is the next guy, and he is uh, out of That's tricks. That. He is out of tricks and vex. I'm making him be naughty for Ethan. Just testing your your ability to concentrate handle a puppy and talk on a live stream um but he's out of tricks and vex he is one of the newest x-men as my mom likes to call them because we have rex nix vex his mom is tricks so there's another x dog in there um he's actually a sixth generation to rex um because it goes rex nix vex quest tricks hex so a lot of uh, X's in there, but he is a puppy that we're really excited about. I know Ethan's really excited about. He's already showing us that he has the ability to do all the things. Um, he can he can settle down. Like I said, there's a lot of distractions right now, but he can settle down <coughs> and be a super sweet cuddle bug. Um, when he's playing in the house in the evenings, he wants to come over and hang out in your lap and chew on his toys and play. Uh, he is a retrieving little fool already, which is awesome. We've been doing some retrieving stuff with him. And his focus for training is pretty good. Uh, the one thing that I would say about him is he is a slow eater. Mm -hmm. It's like kibble He's by kibble better. by kibble. He is getting better, but um, we have had puppies in the past where they don't even crunch their food. It's just like gulp, gulp, gone. Not Hex. He's crunch, crunch, crunch. Next. Crunch, crunch, crunch. So he's been a little bit slower in that avenue, which is completely fine, just a different personality trait. And it's uh, interesting when we raise so many puppies that we get to see that personality difference and temperament difference a little bit in the puppies. So, A lot of people want to know kind of how we picked him from the um, – picked him out, how we ended up with him specifically. And I'm going to tell you, this is one of those situations where we trusted our breeder and kind of went with the recommendation that they provided – I mean, didn't you watch the reel with Aiden? He's like, can't we keep them all? I want all three of them. No, this is um, this is one of those things that uh, is a little bit of a line breeding on two really, really nice dogs. And there was a ton of similarities within the litter. We did some temperament testing with all of them, and they all basically scored exactly the same. So it kind of becomes, you know, just grab one, they'll all be great, which is a cool feeling from a breeding standpoint on – uh, what you're seeing and kind of how to 
be able to progress through the program itself. But the this guy has been doing a lot of really, really cool things. I'm excited for his future. I'm excited for what that brings. And a lot of that has come down to just the ease of livability with him and socialization because he goes everywhere with us. Um, you know, we run errands in town, go to the grocery store, whatnot, and he just rides with us. I mean, I leave the car running and let him out when we're in town, but he just goes everywhere. So he gets a lot of crate time, a lot of car rides, a lot of learning to pee on leash when we're in, you know, town and is doing a really great job with that, which is important for a well-balanced, mentally stable dog. Um, he's been doing an excellent job with crate training. I thought that um, our first night home with him was a fluke, but it was not. Uh, he literally slept through the entire night without a peep, and Ethan and I woke up the next morning and looked at each other, and we're like, what just happened? D did we literally just sleep through the entire night with a brand new puppy? And we're like, Psh, must be lucky. And then the next night, it was like basically the same thing. So he's been really awesome as far as sleep ability. I guess. Yeah, in the first, what has it been, two weeks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the first two weeks, I think there's been two nights that I've gotten up with him. And it's primarily because Rex gets up to stumble around in the middle of the night and Old wakes Grandpa him up. Old Grandpa Rex, yeah. Because mm -hmm. he, he needs to typically go out midnight, middle of the night sometime, um, and then he wakes this little guy up when that happens. So, um, But otherwise, he's been he's been awesome. So that's another thing that we really have enjoyed about him is his – quietness and livability in his crate um and now, now i will say about this um, puppy specifically this is one of my least favorite times to get a puppy time of coming year. into the winter yep now granted we've had some warmer temperatures so we haven't had to deal with much of that yet puppies trying to potty when it's cold but it's one of those things that um it's tough okay it I want to be getting started with him on things and then be able to roll right into a hunting season. And, you know, he's going to be a year old come next hunting season. So there's advantages and disadvantages. But um, ultimately, I would say if I had my preference, I would get a probably maybe February to March puppy-ish, born, born in February time frame. And then they would be coming on that category of 8 to 10 months old first hunting season. Yeah, and... That's just from the opportunities that they miss out on between now and a year old. Yeah, you know, that experience that they gain. But I would, I would venture, based on what we're seeing out of him already, as much time, effort, energy we're putting into him, you know, we're following that step-by-step -step plan, basically, um, that we've got put out because it works, guys. And I would bet by the end of December, beginning of January, which our season doesn't end until the end of January here, that he is going to go out and be on a hunt. He'll have a gunfire introduction. He'll be able to recall consistently um, and a bird introduction. And then it'll just be like, well, let's just take him and see what happens. He may not do anything other than run around like a little puppy, but he's going to be out there and gaining experience and exposure from that and learning from some of the big dogs. So it'll be valuable for him to go. Um, and I would expect that he will go before the end of the year. Oh the yeah. end of the season, excuse me. Oh yeah, if he if he checks the boxes, he'll be he'll be on the truck. So, anything else you want to mention about puppies, 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 and puppies before we the start answering questions? El Tesoro oh, dog. Oh, oh my Who gosh! Yeah, somebody somebody asked that question. That's mm -hmm. right. Vale. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, the we've handed out a few different times and different things, but we have the. Uh, a program we're working with some guys down in South Texas. They have a ranch. They wanted, to, in their words, the best of the best of the best bird dogs and came to us for that. So we are training and developing dogs to um, hunt and operate at the top level, and that takes time. So we're picking, hand-picking puppies from each litter, males or females, doesn't really matter. We're just trying to pick the best ones and – um, so she will be part of that, hopefully. Yeah, we're working with a handful of people that uh, we have great relationships with, have a lot of uh, experience with versatile breeds from the raising the puppy standpoint, because obviously we are not raising him and his sister at the same time in our home, because that is a recipe for disaster. That's littermate syndrome, if I've ever heard it. So 
we work with a couple of people um, for the development of these puppies. Um, I, Jessica's helped us raise a puppy. Ian's helping us raise Vale right now. Um, so we have had that opportunity. Charles is going to be guiding with these puppies. Well, not puppies. The dogs. Eventually the puppies, when they have finished their training for that process, um, this is a, like, five-year plan, guys. It's not like, oh, these guys are going to be guiding next year. Uh, not necessarily, because the expectation is for them to be guiding steady to wing shot and fall um, and retrieving and honoring other dogs' retrieves and things like that. Um, but right now we have three dogs in the program. So, so you all know with this, too, that's happening here. I'm holding him. This isn't like... Oh, he's just chilling here. He's struggling, trying to get away. And that's part of this training aspect of things. Keep the mouth up, hands tucked up underneath of here, and just hold him. That's what we've got. Yes. So um, so the three dogs that we've kept up for El Tesoro to date is East, which is... Oh, hush. That's Gosh. one thing. He's a wimpy. Like, literally, I picked him up once, and I must have, like, pinched his skin under his armpit, and he cried, which is not a bad thing. A puppy that's a little bit wimpy, that means that corrections are going to mean something for him when, when it comes down to it. But um, So we've got East, which is Altasoro Sunrise. Mm -hmm. We have Doc, which is Altasoro Medicine Man. Um, East is an Alley Thunder puppy. Doc is a Quest Thunder puppy. Mm -hmm. And then we've got Vale, who's Altasoro Illusion, or Standing Stone's Altasoro Illusion, and she is his, she is his sister, sorry, Trix Vex puppy, so all the relations and stuff, so kind of interesting and fun to uh, follow along with their progress as well. So anything else you wanted to mention before we roll into answering some questions? I saw we had some super chats roll in, so we want to get to those first and foremost, and then we'll kind of pick through some of the other questions that have popped through. Let's rock and roll. Rock and roll. We got Leo Dental Lab. Thank you guys for the super chats. By the way, if you do have a question that's burning a hole in your pocket and you just got to get it asked, if you throw it up on a super chat, we will definitely be able to get to those, and then we're going to filter through what we have time for from there on. So um, he said, thank you for your work, my four-month-old Siberian Husky. Thanks you very much. I learned a lot from your videos, although I don't know English, but I love your channel anyway. Well, thank you. Um, I know it is not a channel for race that I have, but in the same way, I learned many things and tricks to educate mine. So thank you very much. Well, I really appreciate the super chats, and I'm so glad that the videos have been helpful for you training your Husky. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions if you have them. Let's scroll There's back. There's a question up there. What are we drinking this evening? Good old gin and tonic. Ooh, and I got I to gotta highlight my gin of the evening. King, king of beers. Bootlegger gin. The bottle is so pretty. It's got like a thistle on the back. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know, but if you're going to drink a gin and tonic, the tonic can either make or break your drink. And so I'm actually utilizing Schweppes tonic. Is that how you say that? That's how I say it. So, <laughs> yes, that's how it's said. <laughs> and that makes a really good one. I don't have a lime in here, though, because there were no limes up in the loft. So, it is what it is. What do we got here? Here, honey, let me help you. Should, can we enlarge this for you so you don't have to squint at the screen? What else are you planning on enlarging for me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on. There you go. There's a good one right there. What size crayon a dog bed to buy or do you buy? So, good question. Uh, surely it depends a little bit on the breed of dog, but in the kennel, we use the 40 by 25 size crayon beds um, because we do get a variety of breeds and size dogs. In our house, we use the 35 by 23, and all of our dogs fit 100% perfectly on those without any issues. Uh, they like to curl up on them, like over here, which you can't see, but Quest is on the, I uh, can't get out of the way enough, but she's on the chair, and then Nix is actually on some dog beds over here from Orvis, and he's curled up in a tight little ball, and those are the 35 by 23 inch size Orvis dog beds that the memory foam literally fits exactly on top of the Coranda bed, so it's like a pillow topper for the Coranda beds. It's my new favorite combo is the Coranda bed with the Orvis pillow topper. 
basically. Um, his brother's bitey too. Uh, that's smoke, isn't it? Yeah, he's uh, he looks like the spitting image of Vex. I think he's going to be gorgeous. Um, this this litter probably is going to be bitey based on what I'm seeing out of him. So if you need help or have issues, definitely reach out. Okay, Kristen. Uh, so um, M S Cotty, I butchered that. Miss Kate? Miss Kate? I don't know. We'll never know. <laughs> uh, literally, I just <laughs> talked to, just, this is a segue, but I was just talking to a customer service representative because we got a delivery that was missing one thing, and I've called twice now and <laughs> been transferred and supposedly going to get help moving forward. And I said, so what if they don't reach back out to me moving forward for help from this? Um, and <laughs> the customer service representative <laughs> said, well, I guess we'll never know. And I'm like, that's not a great answer. So we'll, we'll be following up with that. But um, anyway, how do you even start looking for a breeder for a GSP puppy? Is there a register or just word of mouth references for Minnesota? Um, that's a great question. And it is difficult because you have to put your trust in somebody and you have to um, feel comfortable with who you're choosing as a breeder. And, you know, you want to pick up breeder that's going to be producing a puppy that's going to fit what you're looking for uh, from temperament to health to livability to hunting ability. So um, when you reach out to breeders asking specific questions to make sure that they are, you know, checking those boxes, boxes of what you're looking for is really important. Ask them for references. You know, if you reach out to us and you say, hey, do you have a list of references of people that have sent their dogs to you for training, have purchased puppies from you, things like that, I will absolutely get you a list of those references. Um, and you can go ahead and reach out to anybody on that list. I've confirmed that those people are okay to be reached out to and, you know, giving their numbers away. Um, but that would be something that I would say that you should feel completely confident asking um, for a list of references. Um, and then just looking at the dogs in a sense of, are the dogs that are being bred proven in a sense that they have had health clearances done? Are they proven in a sense of I'm looking for a hunting dog? So do they have any level of hunting titles? Um, I plan on being a foot hunting dog. So even if these dogs have field trial titles, that might not necessarily fit what you're looking for as a foot hunter. Or maybe you're looking for a dog that you can do agility or um, show with. Well, getting a dog from a breeder that puts emphasis on that would be also important. So um, asking those specific questions would be really important. Um, and then feeling comfortable and confident that you can reach out to those people, ask them questions, get a hold of them easily, because this is a relationship that you're going to want to build with that breeder, not only in the short term of getting on a list, picking a puppy, but for years after when you have that puppy through hopefully 10, 12, 15 years of life, if you ever have questions, concerns, issues, that you have that person to reach out to for resources. So I don't have specific names that I can throw out there as far as breeders that I would want to recommend for you, but that would be where I would start is asking those questions when you reach out to breeders. We kind of touched on this next one a little bit already, but it's a great question. Yeah. Um, Matthew Ratterman said, when is the best age to bring a dog into their first season or when should get a puppy to start training for bird hunting? I, I thought I would let you talk for uh, like a second and then I'll cut you off. Wait a second. I'm going to start here now. How about... Ah! So the um, biggest thing is going to be it's more about what the dog knows and less about what age they are. And that's kind of the approach that we take to a majority of different training. Now, there are some things that we do say this is kind of better for an older dog. But um, on average, when it comes to hunting, we created a video about this and it was the must haves to take your dog hunting. Uh, I can probably find it or if you search that, it will probably come up as well. The um, biggest things are we want to see a proper gunfire and introduction, okay? Then you need to have a proper bird introduction. And uh, finally ending with a dog that will come back to you when you call. So typically in that situation, we're looking for 
fully collar condition. This is a dog that will come when you call, so you're not going to lose them. And they're fine with gunfire and birds. Take them hunting. If that is five months old, six months old, four months old, uh, 12 months old, doesn't matter. Agreed. I wonder if he needs to poop. Probably does. <laughs> because he ate, did his training session before we did the video. Oh, Dustin, you're going to take him out? Oh, thank you. Hopefully he can get his business done. Hey, there you go. Microphone. Uh, this was a good question and one that I think is really important to hit on, especially with puppies, children. Obviously, we have both. Uh, from Jamie Garay, can you talk about how to coach kids in learning to help train the puppy? So here it is, folks. What? Ethan's brutally honest comment. Yeah, give it to me, baby. Uh huh. Uh huh. Tell him to toughen up first of all. Okay. <laughs> Tell your kids to toughen up. Rub a little dirt on it. They'll be fine. No, I, I mean that lovingly, though. It's a brutally honest comment that I mildly retract because I understand. I love my children. I don't like to see them hurt or sad or any of the above. And puppies can be mean. They have needle teeth, and yes. they scratch you, and they do all kinds of things. And imagine if all of that was happening at your face level, right? If, if we all had dogs that were puppies and acted like puppies that were the size of small horses in uh, comparison, right? Just knocking us over and biting our faces. Uh, not fun. But um, what we have had to do, and this is 100% it, is it's like, hey, you got to stand up. You can't run from the puppy or the puppy's going to chase you. If the puppy jumps on you, you've got to push it down and say, no, puppy. Um, having a collar, he's learned that more recently. He can grab a hold of the puppy's collar and say, hey, no. Give him a little shake. The pup, you and know, he's puppy a little almost four year old child. So yes. he's got minimal, you know, strength, but he'll grab that puppy by the collar ah, and shove him to the ground. And then puppy stops jumping on him and biting him, which yes. is exactly what we want to see. Um, I think that this is really interesting. Before we had children, making broad generalizations was easy because. I had not a complete understanding of what children are truly capable of, right? Well, now we have children. Uh, we have two of them, and I've been able to see when that tipping point is of true understanding and a way to follow directions and being physically capable of doing some of those training tasks because timing, most important part of dog training. So I'm not going to have Aiden trying to press the clicker with the perfect timing of marking sits. There are complete, full-grown adults that struggle with timing. So I'm not going to expect that of him. But I 100% can mark that behavior and then allow him to feed the puppy the food reward. Um, he is completely capable of that. He's completely capable of clipping a leash to the puppy's collar and taking him outside um, and correcting him when he is kind of getting up in his face. And I think that that really happened at like that three, three and a half year old mark. And then as just become better as he's gotten older and is physically more able to do things um, and can follow directions just a little bit better for the most part. Um, but that was kind of that tipping point of when I saw a huge change in the interactions with him and puppies. And his ability to be able to focus and, and yeah, listen sure. and help, you know, it plays a part of it. Now, at the same time, um, we get a question a lot, okay, in regards to how do we keep our puppy from playing with the kids' toys or getting into this or getting into that. And, I mean, it's, it's a black and white answer. You got to pick them up and put them away, okay? So, in the beginning, that's the key. If they aren't there... You, they can't play with them. And an ounce of prevention, I say this uh, like almost like a broken record, is worth a pound of cure, okay? If they don't have a whole bunch of baby toys or kids' toys or whatever to chew up and destroy or carry around or get into, they don't have the opportunity to learn that those are something to get into. It's the same thing that happens with um, Basically, having the opportunity to counter surf or having the opportunity to get into things, 
or I, I don't know I- anything and everything that your dog is doing bad. Um, folks ask, and this is segueing, but folks ask about yeah you know, keeping dogs from jumping on counters, right? Um, the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So we need to set our dogs up for success, and that comes hand in hand with puppies have realist and puppies and children have realistic expectations and then follow through with things and understand i mean i don't know how to put an exact number on it but your puppies are going to be puppies for a a while okay um some mature faster than others but i wouldn't be surprised if you don't see a level of maturity that gets you out of that constantly supervising state until six to 12 months. Okay. That's the category where you may be able to start asking a little more, expecting a little more tipping that scale over until life is a little bit easier. Um, but until that point, you know, expect constant supervision, constant supervision, because otherwise you can't really expect duration. Um, they have, you know, very short attention span. So you can't expect them to stay on a dog bed and stay out of things for long amounts of time. Absolutely. Great question. So I just have to say this because boop, boop, toot our horn. From Kirsten Jensen, Hex's brother Smoke, Trix, and Vex slept through the night by night three. It's been wonderful. Best puppy we've had bar none. So that's awesome. Love the feedback. Love to hear about it. Um, We've been obviously really happy with Hex too. So I love hearing those type of stories. Uh, Kaylin Kelly, potty training puppies in the winter sucks here, especially negative 30 to negative 40 Celsius. I was thinking that's Fahrenheit, but I have to do some calculations because I don't really Where know. Where is the scale? Like, is it negative 60 or something? Zero is and zero is the same, isn't it? No, it's like negative 60 or somewhere in that vicinity. It's what's up? Yeah, zero oh. degrees Celsius is 30 degrees Fahrenheit. 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So, Which is, so freezing is freezing. So burr. Either way, whatever that temperature is in Fahrenheit, it's really way, way, way too cold to um, be living in that, whether you're a puppy or a person. Negative 40. So oh, gosh. when you're saying negative 40 degrees Celsius, it's also negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Been so there, done that in North Dakota in college, and I don't. Mm-hmm. Live, I don't live there anymore. So, um, mm-hmm. but yes, that would be very difficult to potty train puppies because they are not going to want to spend any amount of time outside. Um, best bet when you've got temperatures like that, or if you've got conditions like rainy conditions where the puppy doesn't want to go outside, you need to go with the puppy out to spend time to try and get them walking around potting. And my recommendation for people that are struggling with potty training, their puppy goes out, they don't want to be in the cold or the rain or whatever and go potty is don't bring them back inside and let them romp around and do their thing. Cause they are going to absolutely be like, Oh, so comfortable pee. Um, put them back in their crate for a few minutes, like 10 minutes back outside, try an opportunity to potty it again. Repeat until you get a potty outside basically. Then Buy yourself a time machine, go back in time, and decide to <laughs> pick a puppy up in the <laughs> spring. <laughs> Touche. Um, it would be hard. It would be so hard. Yeah. Uh, enigma. Igma. Uh, when is the right age to enigma? start? Enigma. <laughs> enigma. <laughs> ha. Is that real? Uh, it's a thing. I well, know. I know Enigma is a thing, but I'm wondering if that person's name is supposed to be a play on words or is his real name. <laughs> when is the right age to start intros to gunshot? So um, we typically introduce birds and gunfire approximately the same time because we utilize birds for gunfire introductions. Puppies are really pumped up about birds and they're really pumped up about live birds dead birds eh, can be interesting but most of the time that movement that flapping that you know bird that can't actually fly away but is running and flapping away incites their prey drive it really pumps them up and that keeps them focused enough to introduce gunfire without any issues Um, so you need your puppy to be able to focus and track on that bird that's flapping, flying away. Um, It's not flying away, but flapping away, you know, kind of coasting away when you're tossing these birds. So I would say at least four months is usually when the puppies have enough focus and ability to track that. 
What about you? Four months? Yeah, I would say on average. I mean, we've tried something a little younger, but it's it's one of those that a lot of times they just, uh, and they're like, whoa, squirrel, you know. Yeah, I, I don't or they know, don't follow and chase strongly yeah. enough because you need There's a really strong There's probably some chase. science behind that on when the eyes are 100% developed, but I don't know what it is. When did dog's eyes 100% develop? We ask, you answer tonight, folks. Let us know. <laughs> I was thinking, I was literally thinking about that video do you remember the video we did with, was it Thunder and Zephyr, which with the positive pigeons, and one of them was one age and one was the other? Do you remember that? No. Okay, well, I will find it because I'm amazing that way. Here it is. Positive pigeon drill, 12-week-old versus 20-weeks-old. Hey, I told you I'm amazing and I know everything. Uh, I know all of the videos that we've put out on YouTube. A bold <laughs> statement, sister. <laughs> I I recovered. Um, but so this positive <laughs> pigeon drill, which is a very early stage to like what we would be doing with a gunfire introduction, is, um, you know, puppies being able to track and follow that bird. So at 12 weeks old, Zephyr was not super great at chasing. He was a little distracted. And then at 20 weeks old, same drill, same time. Thunder was doing it, much more focused, able to track that pigeon. So similar-esque in the sense that at 20 weeks old, which is five months old, um, math, uh, was much better than like the 12-week mark. So like I said, four to five months, you're probably looking at a better option for that. Absolutely. This is a, a, a good one, and it's a question that gets brought up pretty regularly, okay? Um, it says here... Uh, Kirsten Jensen said, if most of our hunters in the family are left-handed shooters, should we teach our dog to heal on the right side? Okay, so this is cool. Um, we heal all of our dogs on the left side, and there's a lot of different things that go in with that. And um, one of which is shooting preference-ish. Another is muscle memory. Another probably at this point becomes... Um, hand dominance aspect of things. I want my dominant hand free to do things with. So I've got a dog over here. Um, and then the last would be if you are walking on the appropriate side of the road, sidewalk or not. Um, so that would be walking basically against traffic, right? I'm thinking about this, right? You'd be, traffic is coming at you. You're going to be on the sidewalk on the left side of the road not on the right side of the road where traffic would be coming over your left shoulder, right? Correct. Okay, so you're walking down the sidewalk. The dog is now officially away from the road itself if it's on your left side. So that, I think, probably plays into it from an obedience standpoint, but there really is no true written rule. Whatever it is, pick something and be consistent. If you feel most comfortable having your dog on the right side or the left side, whatever, do do what fits you. Do what suits you. And we've absolutely trained dogs for clients at the kennel that are left-handed mm -hmm. and have had a preference for their dog to be healed on the right. And we've just adapted our training to heal that dog on the right so that they are confident and comfortable doing that and conditioned to healing on the right. So Now, dogs um, can actually learn to heal on both. And when we do some more advanced stuff, we run multiple dogs. A lot of times we'll kind of heal a little looser and they have the ability to essentially jockey for position slash somebody will float to the right. There's just dogs around you and kind of a healing type like of Like in a healing flow. bubble. Yeah. A healing yeah. bubble. But um, strict healing aspect of things, um, pick a side, be consistent with pick it. Pick a side, so. any side, and then stick with it. So we had a couple NA questions pop through. Michelle Vasquez said, Ethan, did you run Vale for her NA test? So Vale is the same age as um, little Hex butt over there, which is not old enough to be running an NA test yet. Yeah, um, he's only 10 weeks old. So um, we typically run our puppies anywhere from 6 months to 11 months old, just depending on timing of the year, things like that. So she has not run yet, and she will run, but probably not until she's over 6 months old. 
there was another question from Kelly. She asked, Kat, how was your NA run? So um, it's been a minute. Um, I was thinking back. I'm like, when was the last time I ran a dog? Because I had Cade last year. A couple of days ago. <sighs> Other than that, oh. like when was the last time I'd run NA dogs prior to that? It had Ooh. been uh, probably like a year or two ago because I'd been um, – pregnant with Cade and then breastfeeding and it's kind of a pain to do that so <laughs> and travel and all that so Jess had been running some NA dogs for us but I got to run Legacy and Doc at their NA test and then Jessica actually ran her puppy Sous Vide and um, Sous Vide and Legacy got the same score they both got 110 prize ones uh, they lost a little a uh, one point in their track um, it was a tough tracking weekend, and Doc actually lost all of his points in track, um, and but he still got a 106, but it was a prize three. So uh, we were really proud of the puppies. They did a great job. They're absolutely, absolutely going to go hunt the heck out of them this fall. So uh, they will learn a lot and then be moving on to Doc bigger and, and Legacy better things. Legacy have already been back and forth between South Dakota three times. And they're going. They're leaving tomorrow for their fourth trip to South Ba-dum, Dakota. Ba-dum. So they are going to hunt, hunt, hunt. They're all of the hunting experience that they lacked last year because of their age. They are gaining this year. So mm-hmm. this is a good one. Thoughts on wire-haired pointing griffons? I think that if I had the opportunity to switch breeds outside of German short hair pointers, I would switch to wire-haired pointing griffons. You are lying. I am, but I wouldn't switch to any other breed. So I would say that about any breed you ask me. If I were to switch, which is not happening, I would definitely be switching. Um, so there I are have some really nice griffs out there. Absolutely. But one thing that I want to throw out there is we've worked with a couple griffs lately that the owners have purchased in the expectation that they are going to be their primary waterfall dog. And these griffs don't love the water that we have worked with specifically. Yeah, the ones that we've gotten the opportunity to, yeah. That is the same in any breed. So you can get short hairs that have been bred so far in one direction towards the field that they really don't have the versatility and the water love um, that that our short hairs do. So you have to pick your breeder based on your goals and that they're breeding for what you want. So these Griffons that we've worked with, unfortunately, haven't had a lot of water love. And unfortunately, their owners had purchased them in the hopes that that's what they would primarily be used for. Uh, they have excelled as upland dogs, though, and we've put emphasis on that, and their owners have been happy. But that was not the purpose that they had purchased them for. So make sure that if you are looking into a Griff for the purpose of waterfall hunting, that you're specifically looking at the parentage, seeing if those dogs do love the water, if those do do waterfowl hunting. Um, Just make sure of that. And also, you're going to want to get some grooming tools. Just saying. Yeah, I would say I've worked with some really, really good griffs, and we've worked with some really not-so-good griffs, which is the same all the way across the board of every breed that we've ever worked with. Now, um, like Kat said, find a breeder that's doing it right and, and reaching toward the same goals as you. But even just just yesterday, I got the oppor- to see, opportunity excuse me, to see all three um, zones of the spectrum, a pretty well-balanced, covered ground well, active hunter, Griff, a very methodical, didn't get after it too hard kind of Griff. And um, though a nice job, nice dog, excuse me, did things well, but I would say he fell into the category of what the average person would hear or describe as a griff, you know, just a, a gentleman's gun dog where they're closer work and they're easier to work with all the things. And we have a half step above that or a little more than a half step. And then we had a couple steps above that, which borderline outran some of our short hairs. Um, and so there are a wide variety of personalities and temperaments and dispositions. Um, Try and find the breeder. This is we can't stress this enough. Try and find the breeder. If griffs, you know, tickle your fancy, find the griff breeder that's going to do what you're looking to do. And Absolutely. if you can't find that, that's when you should say, Well, maybe there are no breeders. Maybe this isn't the right breed for me. I'm looking for this. There's a there's a good number of versatile dogs out there. There's a good number of different retrievers out there. You find somebody that's that's moving the direction you're looking for. 
And I think that that is something that everyone should understand is there is a spectrum in every single breed. You saying I'm on the spectrum? Yeah. And so are the short hairs and griffs of this world. But um, you're going to have the dogs that have more water love, the dogs that have more upland ability, the dogs that have a retrieving dr- drive. And you're going to have to find that spectrum and find that balance on that spectrum of what you're looking for. So I don't know. Is, this, I'm is char- this the spectrum? I'm in charge of this mouse. Get out of here. I just reached into your spectrum. Yeah. Well, so... Um, this was a good question from Kay. Kaylin Kelly and one that gets asked a little bit. So I'm just going to quickly touch on it is, um, I heard you guys talking about taking Hex into town. What's your protocol for pups that eight weeks plus, but aren't fully vaccinated yet? Do you take them places or wait? So we cool. do take them places, but we avoid high traffic dog areas. So he's not going to any, um, dog parks. I don't take him into Petco, Pet Smart places like that. He literally rides in the car. I park at the, you know, Walmart or the Dylan's gas station or wherever, the grocery store. I go in, get my groceries, come out, give him a potty break quick, just in a grassy area of the parking lot, throw him back in the car and head home. So it's not like an outing really where we're going for walks or anything like that. Um, going into any dark going to any dog parks, but we're just, you know, he's going along for the ride and getting used to riding in his crate in a car, being quiet, being calm, being okay with that, and then giving him a potty opportunity if he needs it. Great question. I think we are going to Pheasant Fest in Minnesota, Brett. Where do you see that? Sorry. Are you guys going to Pheasant Fest in Minnesota? We'll be there. Uh, Upcoming litters. bells on, if you will. So upcoming litters, the way that our litters work is – We post the planned breedings for each year. So in 2023, January, February timeframe, we will promote those litters. um, But we typically have a full wait list already for 2023. And those litter announcements and plans are for people that are on our wait list to review those puppies or review those litters and decide which litters they'd be interested in getting puppies out of. Um, I typically put people on three litters of their choosing so that if something happens where a litter doesn't take or we have a smaller litter, we still have the opportunity to get them a puppy. Um, Every once in a while, something will become available sooner than um, you've got a wait list deposit down for, and that's just because we had a bigger litter than expected or somebody had to back out for any number of reasons. Um, But typically, we're taking deposits for about a year to two years out especially if you have specifics of coloration, sex that you're looking for, as well as um, hunting, temperament, ability. When's the next hunting trip that you're going to get to go on, Kat? Oh, never. Um, <laughs> I think we might be planning something the week of after Thanksgiving or like right Thanksgiving weekend through Trying. the next week trying. Mm -hmm. We'll see if that coordinates and can make that happen. Otherwise, I'm going quail hunting in December, Mm -hmm. which is kind of a long time away, but I can make it happen. Um, But that's it. And then I go goose hunting in January. Do you think there's any birds here locally, or do you just have to travel all over the place? What, what, what? Is that a question? I'm asking you. I mean, I could hunt here locally, um, but typically it's not as sure of a thing and so it's a little more walking and we've gone here locally we've gone in Kansas um, and gone hunting we've got some friends that have gone hunting with us but that's kind of a spur of the moment hey let's go hunting so it's not necessarily planned the crazy thing is I have drastically less access to land here Um, and I think it's in our general vicinity of the private ground category because so much of it's leased up for deer hunting and you can get a lot more access to hunt in our specific area, if you will, after deer season is over. But that means then you don't start doing anything until January. So let's see if we got time for one more. Hey, I just have to say Matthew Ratterman said by eight weeks of age, the puppy's eyes have fully developed. And they have the vision of an adult dog. But I don't think they have the attention span of an adult dog at that point. And it's like, squirrel, I didn't follow that pigeon that was flying. I'm going to say Corin 2009, 
you need to watch more bird dogs <laughs> and explain to me why their eyes don't work the same as the adults. I think it's the tension span, not eye. Maybe it is, but they seem like they can't track. Like they're learning how to use their vision still. Maybe. Or like speed of the bird. And no, the dogs aren't blind. We have all their eyes <laughs> tested, so they're all good. <laughs> yes, they're not blind. This is kind of an interesting, I don't really have an answer for it, but it's still interesting. Um, this says thoughts on the Lyme disease vaccine. I don't really know a whole lot about that. It was pushed a lot when we lived in Minnesota, and I know is recommended heavily in the north and northeast because of the prevalence of Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses um, that I don't believe they have vaccines for. But um, I got a call just the other day from Ryan said that Rogue tested positive for Lyme. That's what you said. But is not showing any of the symptoms. So it is a, I don't know if it's a, you know, it's essentially, is it present, not are they affected by it? So I don't know. I've seen a lot of dogs have a lot of tick-borne illnesses, but not as many with Lyme's itself. Most of them that you hear about, it's probably because they're more heavily affected by things like rocky spots. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, or shoot, that's the only one I can think of off the top of my head. What are some other tick-borne illnesses? You know any other? No, there's some nasty ones. Um, let's see here. Google. Th I'm gonna just pop in while you're looking up tick-borne illnesses with a quick answer. Bob Heinemann, Heinemann, sorry. Um, how late is too late to train? Anaplasmosis. That was anaplasmosis. I was, I was thinking yeah, something yeah, yeah. with an A, and I couldn't think of it either. There's a few other, but I mean, those were the big ones: Lyme, uh, Rocky Mountain, and anaplasmosis. So. Anaplasmosis. That was the one. Um, how late is too late to train your GSP? Mine knows general commands and returns with the collar, but is too is it too late to train her for upland hunting? She is one. Absolutely not. That is. That is not too late at all. Um, we work with a lot of dogs that are between 11 months and 16 months just starting out. And a lot of those dogs don't even really have many basic obedience um, behaviors, collar conditioned at that point. So not too late at all. Perfect. You got, you got one more in there? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is a good one from okay. Kristen Jensen. Is, it t is there a too early time frame to do impulse training? Nah. Impulse training is, so anything your dog's doing consistently, they're conditioning themselves to. So if your puppy is not exhibiting some impulse control from, you know, patients walking through the door to jumping at you to anything that is an impulse behavior, um, they're going to condition themselves. So interrupt that behavior, find a way to uh, anticipate that they're going to be doing that and think about the situation and go, how can I eliminate the opportunity for them to exhibit that behavior so it doesn't become a pattern and a habit? So if your puppy's constantly jumping up at the counters, um, obviously smoke is too old, too little yet to actually jump on the counters, but he can absolutely be jumping at the counters and like scrabbling at the counters in the cupboards. Um, so if he's doing that when you're in the kitchen, find a way to eliminate that opportunity. Um, give him a chew bone. Go put it on the dog bed. Every time he leaves the dog bed with that chew bone, take it back and be like, hey, this is the place that you chew on this chew bone. This is where you do that. This is a really good place to condition that behavior. And look, while you're doing that, now I can be in the kitchen and that eliminates you jumping on the counters. Just as one random example. The first handful of times that you do that, it's like a constant game. Oh, yeah. Like they get like off, you forth, grab it, you forth. put it back. Get off, you grab it, you put it back. Get off, you grab it, you put it back. That's it. Over and over and over and over and over again. So chasing the cat. Yeah, chasing the cat sounds like a fun game. I mean, tether your puppy in the house and then um, don't let him chase the cat. Sponsor of the evening is Budweiser. <laughs> um, let's leave this with this. We've said this a couple times, but this is cool. Just a thought from Matthew said if their eyesight isn't fully developed until they're eight weeks old, I'd imagine that they're still adjusting to the ability to use this as a primary sense. I like the way you're, you're thinking. Awesome, folks. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, I love sitting down in the evening, chatting with you, having a drink, answering some questions, and 
on that note, when will the next time we be on? Because it won't be next week. I'm out of town. Sorry. And it won't be the next week because you're out of town. So it looks like the next time that we'll be doing a live chat with Ethan and Kat is the 16th of November, guys. 16th of November. Mark it down on the calendar. We'll post some announcements. And because it's been a little while... We'll give away something uber super special. Because big. nobody bingoed tonight. I think somebody oh. should have bingoed tonight. Nobody has bingoed nobody tonight. Nobody bingoed tonight. Well, folks, on that note, I'm the guy with the pink gun. I'm Cat the Dog Trainer. We'll see you in the next video.